Um, so I'll just want to put up the slide for our e-extension website. Um, there's been a number of questions about the financial feasibility and the payback period of these. Um, Environmental Finance Center is leading the effort to take all the information that the farmers have helped us gather on the financial feasibility um, and do a really comprehensive analysis of this. Um, and we are that, that's going to be included in our final report. And this is where we will post that information. Um, and this website was also created um, at, to serve as a potential landing place for other folks involved in third-party evaluation of these farm-scale thermal technologies. So, um, our hope is that others will be able to add to this website after our project ends. Um, so I think we heard, we touched on some of the financial questions, but we don't have that. We don't. We're not ready to answer your question yet, but we will be um, by the end of this year. We'll have a significant. Uh, we'll have some to say on that. D David, you had asked about incorporation of litter. Um, just for the record, we were talking about immediate incorporation um, with that with that particular slide. Um, and there was also a question about the moisture content of litter and how that affects the operation of the gasifier um, and questions about a drying system. Preston, can I um, get you to, to say a few words on that? As far as drying systems, um, there were two questions, one about passive solar drying system and one just in, in general about drying poultry litter uh, or other manures as well. Uh, yes, drying is very feasible. Even so, passive solar drying is feasible. There's not a lot of research on that. But if you take heat and uh, poultry litter, you can smell poultry litter. Or get, the ammonia will be driven off even at room temperature or, or you know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit outside, you can smell ammonia. So you need to be conscious if you dry any uh, manure, dairy manure, pig manure, poultry litter, what have you, that the fumes coming off are not going to be water vapor or just water vapor. You're going to have ammonia, ammonia and potentially um, hydrogen sulfide, things like that. Uh, so you need to capture those emissions. Um, and if you're doing combustion or some kind of combustion, paralysis, gasification, what have you, the best is to pull those fumes into the system through the combustion process, to oxidize those elements, or use ammonia to scrub NOx. Um, so they're not, you're not venting um, emissions, uh, things like ammonia, into the atmosphere. Um, and you still capture the you're still able to use the heat to pre-dry and have a dryer feedstock going into your system. So you really win in both ways. It's just a matter of testing it. Um, you know, there's some people that have tested pre-drying systems on a small and large scale. Um, it can be done. It has been done. You just have to implement them and make sure there's a need for it. Um, on a small scale, it's capital cost. It's another piece of equipment the farmer has to operate and maintain. So try your best to make the systems as simple as possible. Thank you, Preston. Um, Carl, I'm seeing your question about um, thoughts about having an integrated strategy for manure management on the farm, looking at all options to keep the price, the process cost effective. Um, and you know, one strategy that we had learned a lot from Mike Weaver um, and and others, and John Ignat, for example, um, is the idea of doing a um, looking at energy efficiency and energy conservation. Um, and John, if you want to take that, that question and relative to the um, thermal manure energy projects. Sure, no, I, I'd be happy to if I, if I understand the question correctly. I, um, you know, I, I, these, these systems need to be uh, fully integrated into the farm, and that's why we're appreciative of the, the host farmers for sharing their experiences, because if if it's something that uh, gets in the way of, of other higher priorities, uh, because in terms of maintenance cost, maintenance time, uh, amount of babysitting uh, for the unit, that kind of thing, well, it's just not sustainable from a variety of standpoints. Uh, so it very much needs to be integrated uh, into the farm. And Kristen, I think the aspect of the question that that, that you added to it, if I understand right, right, is that you know from the lens of these as energy projects. What are the alternatives for uh, reducing overall energy needs in terms of on-farm energy efficiency improvements? And how uh, do these thermal energy systems uh, fit within that? Uh, so I, I think that's also a key part of it, too.
And if any of our growers want to address that, I think we have just a couple more minutes. Well, if we, one of the key factors I think to this is if we could develop a market for this ash that's produced by these furnaces, at least the one that mine produces, what mine produces, uh, it it has a value of about uh, twenty to thirty times more than than the litter itself, uh, at least uh, for what we can sell it for here in our area. So not only would it produce energy to heat their houses, we would have a significant income from the ash that it produces, which is a win-win for, for growers, <clears throat> especially considering the fact that it's been so long since we had a pay increase. Um, and it's uh, essentially free heat. So, you know, we, we couldn't have a better situation, really. All we need is a, an affordable system that will burn it efficiently and that's reliable. Okay, thanks. Um, if anyone else has any questions, um, we would welcome to we'd be welcome to hear from you offline. Um, you can contact myself or Preston or John, and we'd be happy to talk to you more about these systems.